we will. I think we will. <laughs> Finish barn burning today and maybe get into a little bit of uh, Flannery O'Connor's good man is hard to find. Or we might sp spend a little bit of time, um, the two excerpts of letters of hers that I have on the syllabus. So middle of 483, where we left off with was... Abner says to Sardi, Abner's the father, remember Sardi is the boy. The elder brother does not get a name or is not named, and the two sisters are not named. All we're told about the two sisters is that they are bovine. They're like cows, okay? So, middle 483, they arrive at their new two-room shack, and Abner says to the boy, to Sardi, come with me. Me? Yes, you. And the mother says, Abner. Does she say it like that? Or does she go, Abner? Because his response is kind of, I think, indicative of how she's calling out his name. I reckon I'll have a word with a man that aims to begin tomorrow, owning me body and soul for the next eight months. Do we know what month of the year it is? At one point, I think it, it was... On the previous page, at one point we're told it is mid-May, or sometime in May, and on the last page of the story, we're told it is early summer, okay? I don't think that's meant summer literally, like after June 22nd. So it's late spring, early summer. So they go back up the road, and we're told the boy, a week ago, beginning of paragraph 40, or before last night, that is, he would have asked they were, where they were going, but not now. Why not now? The very next sentence. His father had struck him before last night, but never before had he paused afterward to explain why. Well, you remember when his father struck him the night before? It's at the bottom of 482. Why did he hit him? What did he say Sardi was going to do if he had gone up to the front of that general store and answered questions from the Justice of the Peace? Exactly. You were going to tell him. You were going to tell him the truth. He says, bottom of 482 again, you're getting to be a man. He's 10 years old. You're getting to be a man. You got to learn. What is it he has got to learn? You got to learn to stick to your own blood or you ain't going to have any blood to stick to you. What does he mean you ain't going to have any blood to stick to you? He'll be alone. How? Who won't be loyal to him? That's what he means if you don't stick to your family. If you don't stick to your family, no one's going to stick by you, is what he's saying. So the only thing we have going in life, okay, is our families. They're the only ones who will supposedly stick through thick and thin. Okay, that's one of the issues Faulkner wants to address in here is... Let me put it this way. How do you choose what to do? What if your family, your blood, Tells you to do something that society, or what is, let's say, moral, or immoral, or illegal versus 
legal. What if your what if your family tells you to do something that's illegal? What if your family tells you to do something that is immoral? Because immoral and illegal are not the same things, right? It is not immoral to drive 26 miles an hour in a 25 mile an hour school zone or speed zone. It's not immoral. It's illegal. But the two are not the same, right? It's immoral to go out and shoot somebody for no good reason. I would be one of those who say, who would say, it might not be immoral if one has a good reason. It would depend upon what the reason is and what the context is. If you're in the middle of the Battle of Fallujah, you better be shooting. Okay? If you're in downtown Murfreesboro on the square and you disagree with a protester, not a good reason. Okay? What's Adler saying? Stick with your blood, what? No matter what. Okay? You gotta learn to stick to your blood, or you ain't gonna have any blood to stick to you. Do you think either of them, any man there this morning, would? That is, would any man there, either of them, he says, who are the either of them? Who are the two? The Justice of the Peace and Mr. Harris. Okay? He says, do you think either of them would have stuck with you? I'll go back for a moment. Where we have Sardi thinking as he's starting to walk up. And he hears the Justice of the Peace say, <clears throat> Colonel Sartoris? Oh, I reckon anybody named for Colonel Sartoris in this country can't help but tell the truth, can they? The boy said nothing. He thinks, enemy, enemy. And he doesn't see the look on the justice's face. That the justice's face was kindly, nor discern that his voice was troubled when he spoke to the man. The justice of the peace does not want to put this boy on a witness stand. In other words, our narrator is set up in opposition to what Abner says. So who do we believe? The narrator or Abner? Okay. 20 years later, the boy would think to himself, notice what's that telling us? Boy doesn't die anytime soon. If I had said they wanted only truth, justice, he would have hit me again. So 20 years later, I think it's safe to say, the boy's thinking back and thinks, no, oh, they only wanted to hear the truth. They only wanted real justice. It's not what Abner wants, obviously. Okay? So, back to the present. They make their way to a grove of oaks and cedars and other flowery trees, etc. And he sees the house for the first time. Middle of that paragraph at the bottom of 483. And at that instant, he forgot his father and the terror and despair both. And even when he remembered his father again, who had not stopped, that his dad keeps walking, but Abner, excuse me, Sardi stops dead in his tracks. The terror and despair did not return. Why? Because for all the 12 movings, they had sojourned until now in a poor country. A land of small farms, fields, houses. He'd never seen a house like this. Big as a courthouse, he thinks. You need an example of the house. Turn to, very briefly, page 479, where you have a picture of Faulkner's house. Named Rowan Oak. Right? When he bought this house, it was dilapidated and falling apart. He put money in it, turned it around. Now, if I remember right, it's on the National Register of Historic Places. Okay? But look at the long walkway lined with big trees, big multi-columned house, veranda. This is the kind of house Sardi sees for the first time in his life. And what does he immediately think? One, it's big as a courthouse. Has he seen a courthouse before? We don't know. Where they had 
the court before was where? General store. And he thinks, excuse me, it's big as the courthouse, he thought quietly, with a surge of peace and joy, whose reason he could not have thought into words. That is, the reason why he felt the surge of peace and joy, he could not put into words. He just sees this house, and he's overcome with a sense of peace and joy. Being too young for that. And here apparently is what he thinks. They are safe from him. Who's the they? Whoever lives in that big old house. He can't touch them. People whose lives are a part of this peace and dignity are beyond his touch. Now notice, next thought, what he thinks about his father. He no more to them than a buzzing wasp. These are real people. Daddy's a bug. Only problem is, what kind of bug is he? It's not just an ant. It's not just a fly. A buzzing wasp. What can wasps still do? If you've ever been stung by a wasp, you know, they're a lot worse than a bee sting. They're a lot worse than a yellow jacket sting. Wasp stings... Those suckers hurt. He can still sting them. Capable of stinging for a little moment, but that's all. The spell of this peace and dignity rendering even the barns and stable and cribs which belong to it impervious to the puny flames he might contrive. He doesn't have the power to burn down. The barns, the stables, the cribs of this house. This, the peace and joy ebbing for an instant as he looked back at the stiff black bank. Now, now notice, here's the big house. It's got columns, you know, out in front, it's got this. There's a line of trees, and Sardi's back here. Abner's kept on walking. Abner's already, obviously, taller. Okay. What does this do to, Ab to Sardi's line of sight? Blocks up He's looking. Sorry, I should have this bigger. He's looking at this big house, okay? Like this. If Abner's over here by him, he sees the house in all its glory. But Abner now, because of perspective, looks bigger than the house. Okay? And what does he see? He looked at the stiff black back, the stiff and implacable limp. What does it mean, implacable? If you can be placated, that means what? Louder? Soothed. You can be soothed. That is, what your problems are can be solved. If you are implacable, that means nothing's going to change for you. Okay? So his back is both stiff and his limp is implacable. Nothing will change that limp. Of the figure which was not dwarfed by the house. If it was dwarfed by the house, then, you know, Dad would look like this. For the reason it had never looked big anywhere, that is, his father. His father's not six foot four. His father's a relatively smallish, wiry man. Okay? There's, there is, by the way, and I think it's on YouTube in case you're interested. There's a short film of this with Tommy Lee Jones as Abner Snopes. This is Tommy Lee Jones before he was Tommy Lee Jones. This is when he was pretty much a nobody. And he's a, he's a damn good Abner Snopes. Okay? In which now, Abner's body, against the serene column backdrop, had more than ever that, and again, another word that means unchanging, stiff, 
that impervious quality of something cut ruthlessly from tin, depthless, as though sideways to the sun it would cast no shadow. So if we were talking about fiction, and we're talking about characterization, and how authors can create character, they can show us, or they can tell us, we've just been told things about Abner. Okay? He's one-dimensional, like a piece of tin. He doesn't show any emotional depth. He doesn't show any change. He doesn't show any growth. Abner does. Excuse me. Sardi does. Sardi changes from the beginning of the story to the end of the story. He's dynamic in that sense. Okay? So the boy watches his father. Notice, he's still here. He's kind of like stuck in a trance. And he watches his father. And as, as his father walks down the path, what's he see in the middle of it? Big old pile of horse droppings. The boy remarked the absolutely undeviating course which his father held and saw the stiff foot come squarely down in a pile of fresh droppings where a horse had stood in the drive and which his father could have avoided by a simple change of stride. So his legs like it's locked. He walks like this. There's a pile right there and he steps right in. He could have done a little starter step. He could have stepped aside, but nope. Walked right into it. And the boy thinks, uh, let me go on. It ebbed only for a moment, that is, the boy ebbed only for a moment that he could not have thought into his words, this into words either walking on in the spell of the house, which he could even want, but without envy, without sorrow, certainly never with that, this is describing the father now, that ravening and jealous rage, which unknown to him, walked in the iron-like black coat before him. Notice what fills the black coat, Abner. The ravening and jealous rage. What does it mean to be ravening or to be ravenous? Hungry. How hungry? Starving hungry. Okay. But he's not hungry because ravening modifies what? Rage. This is rage that can never be placated. Rage that can never be lessened. It's also a jealous rage. If it's jealous, then what does that mean? It's kind of like a vacuum. It just sucks in everything around it. Abner's kind of like a living, breathing, walking tornado. Okay? He destroys what he comes into contact with. So, the boy then thinks, maybe he would feel it too. Feel what? The peace, the serenity, the joy. Maybe it will even change him now from what maybe he couldn't help but be. And maybe there's pixies, and if you get their dust and sprinkle it, you'll learn how to fly, right? Because he's thinking here, maybe the sheer sides of this house will make my father change. Change from what? They cross the portico, that is, they walk up the steps. They go across the porch. He could hear his father's stiff foot as it comes down on the board, clock-like finality. Okay. Notice it stepped in the dun. Now it's crossing the porch, smearing a little bit of dung on the porch, bang on the door. They go in. Negro opens the door. And Abner steps in. After the servant says, Wipe your foots, white man, for you'll come in here. Man, you ain't home no how. Get out of my way, nigger. And what does he do? Throws the door back and steps in. And we're told, there on the floor is a beautiful rug. 
And now the boy saw the prints of the stiff foot on the door jamb and saw them appear on the pale rug behind the machine-like deliberation of the foot, which seemed to bear or transmit twice the weight. So he steps on the door jamb, getting a little bit of dung, and then he steps in the middle of this rug, and it's a pale rug. And he puts that foot, that stiff foot with the dung on it, down with, we're told, like with twice his body weight. Okay? Miss Lula comes down, and she says, go away. Major Despain is not home. Will you please go away? Father didn't speak. Doesn't even look at her. He just stood stiff in the center of the rug, in his hat, the shaggy iron gray brows twitching slightly. Then with the same deliberation he turned. The boy watched him pivot on the good leg. So both feet are in the rug now. He pivots on the good leg. And what does he do with the other leg? He drags it. He doesn't, leaving two footprints or three footprints. He drags it and leaves a semicircle stain in the rug. His father had never looked at it, never once looked down at the rug. Okay? And as they leave, they stop at the gate, they turn around, and they look back at the house. Pretty and white. And, Abner says, that sweat. That is, it's man's sweat that keeps that thing pretty and keeps it white, keeps it painted. Nigger sweat. Maybe it ain't white enough yet to suit him. Maybe he wants to mix some white sweat with it. So, two hours later, the boy's chopping wood. And who shows up? Well, Major Despain wasn't home when Abner showed up. So now, notice, Major Despain shows up at Abner's house. Okay. So, his father tells him to set up the wash pot. And... One of the sisters says, middle of 485, if I thought enough of a rug to have, if I thought enough of a rug to have to get hit all the way from France, I wouldn't keep it where folks coming in would have to trump on it. And they lift up the rug. And Abner's wife sees the stain. Abner, let me do it. Do what? What do they have to do? Clean the rug. Abner, you go get dinner. I'll tend to this. So how does Abner clean the rug? He gets some lye soap. What is lye, by the way? It's an acid. So he gets some lye soap, a piece of field stone, rock, out of the field. And he gets the lye soap, and he lathers up that rug, and then he gets that field stone, and he scrubs it. Why? Because this is how you clean your clothes. You scrub them against rocks. So he's using the field stone. So he takes the rug that originally had something like a one-inch nap, and he wears down where the stain was to about a half-inch nap. We're described, we're told, looks like somebody took a little lawnmower over it and gave it a buzz. So now what's he done to the rug? Yeah, now it's ruined. Okay. So... Rug hangs there while they go to bed. And let's see here. They take the rug back. Page 486. Major Despain comes back. Bottom of the page. You must realize you have ruined that rug. Wasn't there anybody here, any of your women? And he just stops. It cost $100. But you never had $100. You never will. So I'm going to charge you 20 bushels of corn against your crop. That is, whatever amount of corn Abner's contract said that he had to raise for Major Spain, 
He now has to add 20 bushels of corn to that. Well, where does that 20 bushels of corn come from? His share. His share because he's a sharecropper. Okay? Now, it might be that his share would only produce 20 bushels. That means he works eight months for nothing. So I'm going to charge you 20 bushels of corn against your crop. I'll add it in your contract. When you come to the commissary, you can sign it. That won't keep Mrs. Despain quiet, but maybe it'll teach you to wipe your feet before you enter her house again. The boy looks at his father. Pap, his father looks at him. You done the best you could. If he hadn't wanted, if he wanted it done differently, why didn't he wait and tell you how? He won't get no twenty bushel. He won't get none. We'll bet we'll get her and hide it. Hide it. Okay. So the boy thinks, middle of that page, seeing his brother are plowing. Paragraph 70, maybe this is the end of it. Maybe even that 20 bushels that seems hard to have to pay for just a rug will be a cheap price for him to stop forever and always from being what he used to be. Maybe he won't even collect the 20 bushels. Maybe it will all add up and balance and vanish. Corn, rug, fire, the terror, grief, the being pulled two ways, like being like between two teams of horses. Who's being pulled two ways? Abner? Sorry, he is. Okay. So they get up, go into town. And there's another justice of the peace. And we hear the justice of the peace talk to Major to Spain and to Abner. And paragraph 75. He says to Abner, and you claim 20 bushels of corn is too high for the damage you did to the rug. Look, man, he brought the rug to me, said he wanted the tracks washed out. I washed the tracks out. I took the rug back. He didn't say, I'm adding this, he didn't say he wanted the rug taken back in its original condition. He just wanted the tracks gone. Tracks are gone. But you didn't carry the rug back in the same condition. Notice you can't answer that. I'm going to find against you, Mr. Snopes. I'm going to find you were responsible for the injury to Major Spain's rug, okay? But, again, notice what this justice of the peace does. It's not clear whether it's the same justice of the peace, though he did say, you burned the rug? <laughs> you know, after you just burned the barn? He says, 20 bushels is too high for you. Major Spain claims it cost $100. October corn will be worth about 50 cents. I figure Major Spain can stand a $95 loss on something he paid cash for. You can stand a $5 loss. You haven't earned yet. So he cuts the damages in half. 20 bushels to 10 bushels. Who loses in this quote-unquote justice? Yeah, Major to Spain loses, right? A hundred dollar rug, he's only getting five dollars damage for that. So what is the justice of the peace showing to Abner? This is mercy, folks. This is not throwing the book at him by any means. He is essentially saying, you're so poor, you're never going to be able to dig out of this hole. So I'm going to cut your losses quite a bit. Boy says, paragraph 80 at the bottom, he won't get no 10 bushels neither. He won't get one. Will, father, think so? Well, we'll have to wait and see. So later that evening, after his father gets more oil during the day, Page 489, it was sundown. And we hear the mother yell, Abner, no, no, oh God, oh God, Abner. And Abner holds her back. 
tells to the boy, tells the older boy, get the five gallon kerosene, go to the barn, tells Sardi, go to the barn, get that can of oil we were oiling the wagon with. What what are you notice? Sardi just sits there. What 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 are you gonna do with that? <laughs> oil. Go get that oil. Go. The boy's running. And as he runs, he thinks. Ten years old. I can run on and on and never look back. Never need to see his face again. Only I can. I can't. The can with the oil in his hand now. And he goes back. And the boy says, Ain't you gonna even send a nigger? Ain't you at least I mean at least you sent a nigger before? What what is Sardi getting at? Why did he send someone before? What was the purpose? It was a warning. Why would he care about sending a warning? Make sure nobody was injured. Make sure livestock possibly got out. So the only thing that burned was the barn itself. Notice now... It's like the stakes have been upped. Now, Abner isn't sending any kind of warning. Now, is it just a barn he's going to burn? Or is it the whole house? And this time the father doesn't strike him. He grabs him. Okay, he Tells the big brother <clears throat> what to do with the oil and such. The brother says, you better tie him up. Right? And Abner tells his wife, hold him. Lenny, take hold of him. Boy's mother's name is Lenny. I want to see you do it. You hold him better now. If he gets loose, don't you know what he's going to do? What'll he do if he gets loose? Run away? He'll run and tell him. Maybe I'd bear time. She says, I'll hold him. See you do then. And let me, uh, sorry, let me go. I don't want to have to hit you. The aunt says, let him go. If he don't go, I'll go myself. Why, why is there so much emphasis put on this? What will happen, what might happen, if Sardi goes and warns them? Abner could get caught. So he runs. To Spain, bottom of 490. Where's? And he sees him coming out from the hall. Barn! Bar what? Barn? Yes, barn! And sorry, he turns around and runs the other direction. He hears Major to Spain call for his horse. And he runs down the drive, final paragraph, page 490, blood and breath roaring. Presently, he's in the road again, though he could not see it. He could not hear either. The galloping mare was almost upon him before he heard her. And even then, he held his course as if the very urgency of his wild grief and need must in a moment more find him wings, waiting until the ultimate instant to hurl him aside and into the weed-choked roadside ditch as the horse thundered past. For an instant in furious silhouette against the stars, the tranquil early summer night sky, which even before the shape of the horse and rider vanished, strained abruptly, strained abruptly and violently upward. That is, the rider and horse go past him. Okay? A long swirling roar, incredible and soundless, blotting the stars, and springing up and into the road again, running again, knowing it was too late, Yet still running, even after he heard, heard, I was going to say hears, changed it, heard the shot. And an instant later, two shots. Why three shots? Three people? Nope. But there's two. Might have missed the first of the second shot. Pausing now without knowing, he had ceased to run, crying, Pip! 
running again before he knew he'd begun to run, stumbling, tripping, father, father. At midnight, he's on the crest of a hill. Are we told what time it was when he started running? No. He did not know it was midnight. He did not know how far he'd come. But there was no glare behind him now. And he sat now, his back toward what he had called home for four days. Okay, so why is it significant that there was no longer any glare behind him? Glare of what? The fire. By implying that previously in the evening, while he ran, he could see a glare behind him. That tells us what about the size of the fire? It's a big one. Okay. I don't know if you've ever been out in the woods or in a meadow, a big open country space when it's really dark. But if you have and you've seen a fire off in the distance, you can see a fire for many miles. I mean, you can see that glare. The implication is, Sardis put a lot of miles between himself and his family. And now he sits and faces the dark woods, which he would enter when breath was strong again. But he lies, he sits there, hugging himself into the remainder of his thin, rotten shirt. The grief and despair, now no longer terror and fear, but just grief and despair. Before, the grief and despair, the old fierce pull of blood, led to terror and fear. Terror of what? What his father was going to do? Fear over having to move again? Fear of what his father was going to do? Or terror and fear of his father? And he thinks, father, my father. He was brave. He was. He was in the war. He was in Colonel Sartor's cavalry. And here's where we're told what he did in Colonel Sartor's cavalry, not knowing that his father had gone to that war, a private in the fine old European sense, wearing no uniform, admitting no authority, excuse me, admitting the authority of and giving fidelity to no man or army or flag. So how did he go to war? Notice, he didn't wear a uniform. He didn't admit authority of anyone over him. He didn't fight in Colonel Sartoris' cavalry. He went to war for what? Himself to steal. Okay? The slow constellations wheeled on. It would be dawn. His breathing was easier. It was almost dawn. He could hear the whippoorwills everywhere now among the trees. He gets up, a little stiff. He walks on down the hill toward the dark woods, within which the liquid silver voices of the birds called unceasing. The rapid and urgent beating of the urgent inquiring heart of the late spring night. He did not look back. So what happened to the old fierce pull of blood? Pulled too tightly. And like a rubber band, snap. What does Sardi show us in making the decision he makes? If you have to choose these, it's better to be what? Alone. He doesn't stand. He doesn't hold with the idea that if you don't stick with your blood, you'll have no blood to stick with you. Sardi noticed has somehow, at 10 years old, an internal moral compass of sorts. He knows what his father's doing wrong. Okay? And what does he do? He breaks from it. How, how, what's the word I want? How bigly does he break from it? He cuts his family off okay? forever. You got a bunch of questions there to help help understand, possibly, you know, the story a little bit. Okay, we'll stop there.
What's that? Today's Wednesday? Friday we'll do, we probably won't get it all done. Um, Good Man is Hard to find, find by Flannery O'Connor. You also have two short excerpts from letters by her to read that are on the syllabus. Read those as well.